Thanks for braving the weather and coming out this morning when I got up. It was pretty, you know, it was beautiful out. I wasn't doing anything. It started to snow, by the time I left, I had four inches on the ground, and I'm going, uh oh. <laughs> so, so here we are. And, and again, if you're not comfortable driving in the snow and the cold weather, my lectures from here on out will, unless there's technology part problems, but I do have a tech person in class that can help me. <laughs> um, they'll all be on Zoom. So, and then it'll be recorded. So we're like, James is gonna be gone. You know, you'll be able to pick up the lectures when you come back. So, so we have we have ways to make this work. So it's nice classes on site analysis, and this is this is one of those classes where you're either going to get it or you're going to just look at me and go, "What is she talking about?" This is where I'm going to teach you how to find the microclimate around your property, <clears throat> and and so that ties into being able to put the right plant in the right place, and knowing how to to with pinpoint accuracy, know that this is going to work. And then the other thing is that when I do yard calls, you know, people typically, rarely call me up to come, have me come look at their beautiful, lush, growing yard and gardens. They usually want me there because something is brown, diseased, dying, or dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And so they want to know why. So the first thing I do, even before I walk onto the site, when I drive up to the place, um, I've got a really cool app on my phone. And so for those of you who are directionally challenged, you can put a compass on this. And so when you get out, you can pull up the compass and go, okay, that's north. And, and so now you know immediately how the sun should be moving through that property. And so a lot of times, just knowing that helps you diagnose some of the plant problems. It also allows you to be able to better put things in the proper place. I did a site analysis a couple of years ago where they wanted to put a vegetable garden in, in a, you know, it's the maintenance people wanted the vegetable garden over there. And it came out and I wasn't really sure where North was. I kind of had a, an idea, but it turned out that North was actually over there and I thought it was there. So that made a huge difference, which meant that their garden was gonna be perpetually in the shade all summer. <laughs> and so I advised that they should actually put it someplace else. Well, <laughs> didn't go for well with the maintenance guys because they, they didn't wanna move it. <laughs> they didn't wanna move their idea. So anyway, <clears throat> it, it helps to know how the sun moves through that property. So you can figure out if, why some things aren't doing well. You know, maybe that plants in too much sun you know, maybe it's in too much shade. You know, I had um, I had a question today about, you know, why is the grass underneath this pine tree not growing well in the summer? Well, it's too shady. It's just flat out too shady. Grass isn't going to grow under a pine tree because of the shade. Don't don't fight it. <laughs> Leave the pine needles. Don't fight it. <laughs> go, go find something else to do. So this class is going to be a lot more of a workshop night, a little, little bit of a lecture, not much. And then there's also a homework component to this, to tonight's class. So when we're, and this class isn't going to go all the way till nine o'clock. We'll end a little early tonight. You do have homework, and it'll be to do the site analysis for your own property. And I know you're you've got you're an apartment complex, right? Yeah. You can still do this, and it'll still help you understand why things are working the way they are. Okay. So we'll have a homework. It's it's pretty easy. And then it's due back next week. I say it's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, if you <laughs> if you want to, you know, lean on someone to help you other than me, by all means, yeah, by all means. And again, if you need to get up and take a break, coffee and snacks, help yourself. Bathrooms down by the elevators. So if you need to get up, go for it. I'm not going to be upset or offended. Has it made it all the way through the room? Yes. Julie, do you have okay. okay, so here's a question for you. True or false? If you want afternoon summer shade, plant a tree on the northwest side of your house. How many say true? How many say false? I'm going to prove that this is true. And actually, you're going to prove it to yourselves on the paper. Okay? So think about where the sun is in the afternoon in the summer. So if you plant a tree on the northwest side of the house, are you going to get afternoon shade? Yes. Mm -hmm. I have some people going, I don't know. Yeah, no, when you're in the avenues or you're in, in some of the shady parts of Cheyenne, it gets complicated. It gets complicated really quick. But it still works. Okay. So when we do site analysis, we're going to start with a plot plan. And this is what your assignment will be too, is to get a plot plan. And you can just get on Google Earth and print one out. Or you can get on the um, the Laramie County GIS site, which is a very cool site. So you can get on that site. It's multiple layers. You can play with it. You can have tons of fun with it. Find your house and you can print off your plot plan. GIS? Yep, GIS. Stands for? Graphical information. Yeah. Thank you. Say it again, please. Graphical information system. Yeah. Geographical information. Yeah, uh, GIS works. So survey would be the same thing. Yeah, if you if you have one, if you when you bought your house or your what you know if you're renting, you're going to just go on Google Earth or, or the GIS site. But if you bought a house, it theoretically should come with a survey. Theoretical. Okay. So when you get this plot plan, it's going to have a ton of information on it. It's going to have um, a survey will have the official seal on it. It says it is a survey. North arrow is always going to point up, just like on a map, north points up, okay? And that way that helps you get orientated. So there's your north arrow pointing up, east, west, south. So it helps you get orientated. This house, this plot plan has got a easement on it. It's good to know about easements because planting trees under easements can be problematic, mm -hmm. especially if you get a big, beautiful tree and they come along and cut it down because they don't like it in that easement. Or uh, where I live, there's um, underground pipelines. You plant a tree on top of their plant pipeline, they're just gonna, uh, that's gonna be gone. Yeah. So you gotta know about these easements. This is out in the county. Huh. It's really important if you live out in the county or you're thinking about moving to the county to know where your septic yes. tank is in the leach field. Those are two really, <laughs> it seems funny. I, I have gone and done yard calls where big, beautiful blue spruce tree is parked on top of the leach field. Oh, no. Yeah. 60 foot tall blue spruce on top of the leach field. You know, that's, that's painful. That's, too That's why it's so big and beautiful. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so the plot plan is also going to tell you where the house is, is located on the property. So it's going to give you, this is 112.4, 112 feet, four inches from that property line, how far it's set back. This is how the road comes through here. So from, from doing a landscape design, this is really, really helpful to know where these structures are. 
because when you start to plant your trees, you need to know the mature size, right? I mean, we've all seen someone take that cute little tree in a one gallon pot and go, well, it's so tiny, I'm just gonna put it right next to the house. <laughs> and it has a 25 foot wide tip to tip spread on it at maturity. So this information helps you a lot to know how to site plants additionally. So the first thing again, get a plot plan, make sure, you know, if it's from buying a house, it should have all this on there. North is always pointing up, just like on a map. Okay, again, if you're not sure, get a compass. There's a lot of cool apps for smartphones, iPhones. The wind. <laughs> so Blondie's opening up the door for Dagwood and she's going ready, ready and whoosh, he gets blown off his feet. And then she says, well, let's try the back door. <laughs> and then this is out at the Cheyenne weather station out at the airport. If it's at zero, it's broken. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, I like the one, beware of low flying trains. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is, you know, 60 and 60 degrees hurricane. I've advised a lot of people who've moved it to the foothills or there's even some that moved to Laramie that you need to have hurricane strength windows. And I've had people look at me and go, the storm that just came through, they were, they were forecasting 80 to 100 mile an hour winds coming off of Sheep Mountain. So it pays. Anyway, there is a map, a wind power, windpoweringamerica.gov map, a wind map. And so this map, if, if you love living in Wyoming, but you hate the wind, this map will help you find places where there isn't as much wind or to avoid the places where it's worse, like up at Bordeaux going to Wheatland. These lines are the grid, the power grid lines. So it's, it's not the highway lines, but it gives you an idea of where those really strong, difficult winds are at. Yep. So we have different types of winds. We have Chinook winds, which are a warming west wind, and they usually come up more from like the Gulf of Mexico and work their way around. We typically have a combination of gap and bora winds, and these gap winds will never go away unless someone can figure out how to move Elk Mountain. <laughs> you know, so these these gap winds, it's a it's a creates a venturi type effect. So you got two. You can have like a building and a barn, which I, I see a lot of house and a barn, where you can have Elk Mountain and the Medicine Bow Range. And it squeezes that wind down. And as it squeezes that wind, it causes the wind to go faster through that gap, yeah. creates a venturi effect. And then the, the boral winds, every time we get a frontal passage, we're going to get wind. And, and we're just right, we're on a ridge, we're on the Dakota Ridge. And so we're, we're going to always have kind of funky winds here. They will. I have been told they were worse 150 years ago. So I appreciate that, but anyway, so the atmosphere consistently tries to be in balance. So anytime you've got a high pressure sitting out east or um, yeah, usually east, northeast, and a low pressure coming over that wants to be in balance. And so that low is gonna wanna go to that high pressure. It's gonna wanna balance itself out. And Cheyenne is fourth in wind for large cities. Could be worse, Rollins, <laughs> Hannah, and Medicine Bow. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Okay, one of the other things that's really important when you do a site analysis, because everybody's place is gonna be a little bit different, is how the wind comes through and, and it impacts your property in your house. So I'm out in the county, I'm in a little valley and the wind just comes straight from the west. I have a neighbor who's up on a hill about a half a mile from me, and the winds actually wrap around and come from the north. And we're just that 
just a little tiny distance makes a really big impact. So when we do a site analysis, we want to mark down where, and this is for when you do your site analysis for, for the homework project, you know, how does the wind move through your property? You know, where is it, where is it the worst? Where is it the best? And then in the summer, the wind changes. And summer winds are going to come from the south, southeast, southwest. And it's just a summer pattern. Winter winds from the west to the north. And then we'll have in the spring, we have um, where a system, if we get a low pressure that drops down into, a, into Lyman, Colorado, and if it moves north or it comes over the top of us, a low pressure and sets up east of us, it causes an upslope situation. And that's where it's gonna come out of the north to northeast. As soon as you feel that wind change and come more to the east, it's moving away. So part of being a gardener is paying attention to your weather and, and kind of getting a feel for how that wind moves through your property. And so it's important to put that down on your site analysis too. Snow. Snow we had today is pretty wet. It's not gonna really blow or drift. I, very, I, sh I shoveled quite a bit of it this morning and as soon as I shoveled it, I had two inches behind me. Rule of thumb on snow drifts. Julie, can you see this back there? Okay. So here's your rule of thumb. Snow is going to drift on the south side of an east-west line, and it's going to drift on the east side of a north-south line. So again, it's one of these things where if you're in town, the wind is gonna move that snow around really kind of weird. But if you're out in the county, this is an important thing to know because you can drift yourself in or you can be able to hold the drifts or, or manipulate it just by that, knowing that. So this picture here, You don't see that really okay. That line of trees is a east-west line. You can see where all that snow is accumulated. And it's formed a big drift and then it kind of peters out and it gets a little bit more well-behaved down there. But to give you an idea of how tall that is, how many of you can find the blue Ford F250 in there? Oh, I see it. Can you find yeah. the truck? Barely. Barely, yeah. There's the truck right there. Yeah. Yep. So that's how deep that can get. And that's, again, is a north. It's on the south side of an east-west line. And then, again, even, you know, this is open prairie. And you can see where the snow is holding on the on the yucca plants. They're all on that south side of those yucca. This is a pasture where the guys have just grazed it to the dirt. There's no grass, there's no nothing there to hold it. The pasture to their south side, they don't graze it at all. And so that tall grass holds the snow and it prevents it from drifting. So if you live out in the county and you're on, on acreage, Mowing like that, like that's overgrazing, but mowing does the same thing. You're going to have drifting problems. But if yeah, you leave the you. grass tall, it's going to hold the snow and you're not going to have snow drift problems. Okay. So you can see where the snow is drifting on this property. This line here is the top of a ridge that goes east and west. And so that snow is accumulated on the south side of that east-west ridge. Then they have this fence 
and it's kind of it kind of goes at an angle, but this is the east side, and so it's holding that snow again on the east side of that north south fence. The only downside to this, and so you guys now know this, right? Okay, you now know this. That's their driveway <laughs> under that snow drift. That's their driveway. Yeah. <laughs> it you know this a lot of this comes from just observing what the snow does out in the prairie and how it, it you know when you're in town it, it changes because you've got more buildings you've got more cars but but pay attention to how it drifts on your property how that snow moves okay views again we're we're talking a site analysis we're looking at this from a perspective of you know, eventually we'll do a landscape design. And so what are your views? You know, on this plot plan, it's pretty easy because, you know, looking west, you're going to have mountains, but you also have this power line. And then you've got a road, and you've got your neighbors, but you have a big old power line right there. So you're looking through the mountains through a power line. So knowing some of this can help you when you do a landscape design, manipulate what you see or what you don't see. So your views, and then when you're doing a design, you know, views to save, views to block, homeowner restrictions. The city of Cheyenne has very, very few restrictions on landscaping. It's usually just involving the height of a tree over a sidewalk, it needs to be pruned up to eight feet and then over the street it should be pruned up to 14 feet so that's that's really you know and then set back away from the curb that's about all Cheyenne has but homeowner associations can have some pretty interesting requirements and restrictions so you just kind of have to be mindful of those topography so I took some artistic liberty with this particular property <laughs> and put in my own interpretation of the lay of the land, mainly because this, this could possibly be the worst case scenario. <laughs> Where are your high points up here, your low points all the way down here. So you got 6,900 feet up there and 930 feet here. It's a pretty good drop, pretty good drop. The closer these lines are together, the steeper the slope. So those topography lines, when they're really tight, is a very is a very steep slope. So when you look at this, where is the snow going to accumulate? Your east-west line, this ridge, your snow is going to accumulate right there, right across the driveway. And then when it melts, it's going to come straight down here, right, right to the house, and then down that way. So being able to see the lay of the land and get a feel for it is real helpful. I would, would hope that they had graded the house and the water coming around it. Mm -hmm. Okay, topography. We really don't think about this a whole lot, but on slopes, zero to 3% slope, flat, gentle sloping, possible surface drainage problems, puddles, that sort of thing but your soil depth is gonna be really good. And that's where you're gonna be able to grow really good trees. You're gonna be able to have a great garden because that soil depth is there. Three to 8% gentle sloping to rolling terrain. Soil is gonna be down in that 3% area. Maybe a little more rocky. Eight to 15% hilly, often rocky terrain, site modification costs increase. Out in Wyoming, there is no soil depth that got blown away. I, I do see this a lot out here. And there's some very nice homes parked on top of the hill because, dang, the view is great, right? But you can't grow any trees. You can't grow a garden, hardly any soil. When they built the house, they scraped all the way. If there was any good soil, they scraped it away. So it's, it's very challenging. And I never really understood why anybody would want to build on top of a hill in Wyoming or Colorado <laughs> for that matter until I went back east 
went all the way out to Worcester, Ohio, and discovered that people back east engage in recreational lawn mowing, and they put all their homes on top of hills. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. So they mow constantly because of the bugs, and they put their house on top of the hill because the valleys flood. But you know, different world, right? Different world. Okay. So this is where it gets interesting, the sun angles, because this really is what drives where and how we plant around our property and around our house. So if you think about where the sun rises on June 21st and then where it sets. So when you look out the window on June 21st and you see where the sun is, and conversely, on the first day of winter, December 21st, you look out the window and where is the sun rising and where is the sun setting? So the sun in the summer is gonna be much higher. It's gonna be farther to the north. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of shade gardens that I have built that are planted on the south side of a hedgerow. Now, how many of you would think of putting a shade garden on the south side of anything? Most of you would wanna put it on you know, the opposite way. But here, in the summer, the north side gets the most amount of sun. And I have a very nice sun garden on the north side of my cabin. I, I see the looks going, what in the world? Yep. No, it makes sense because I've noticed where we live and we're right in Cheyenne that, you know, um, the sun seems to be in one position during the summer months when it's longer than it is during the winter months when they've got your shorter days. So um, yeah, my plants, I have to move them away from the window a little bit more during the summer, summer months because otherwise they're gonna get cooked. <laughs> yep. So we're gonna put pencil to paper and, and wrestle with this one. And then to make it easier, I've got the, I've got my sundial, my, my sun matrix here. And so we're gonna work with this and we're gonna figure out exactly how the sun moves through a couple given properties. And then you'll take this all home with you and you're gonna do a site analysis for your property so that you can kind of get a little bit better handle on it. Okay. The other important thing are utilities, underground utilities, above ground easements, permanent structures, future things. You know, so it helps to have an inventory of where all this stuff is at and how it works. And, and you can't, especially in town, you can't assume that I'm just gonna go dig a big hole in the front yard and I'm gonna be good. You really need to call 811. Has anyone dealt with 811 before? Yep. Yeah, that's, that's fun. Well, your phone doesn't stop ringing for a couple hours. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're coming. It's real important to call 811, even if you're in town and it's the front yard or the backyard. If you run into something with your shovel and you break it, you're liable for it. You call 811 and they mark everything out they miss something and you run into something, then, then you're not liable for it. And some of the newer home subdivisions, Saddle Ridge, they're on natural gas. And I did a yard call out there and the homeowners did not call 811. They didn't even really do a site analysis or go, Oh, I wonder what that meter is all about. Oh, I'm on natural gas. I bet that's my natural gas meter. They parked a ponderosa pine on top of their natural gas pipeline. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> so it, it really helps to, it's not an inconvenience for them. It might make you crazy for a little while, 
but that helps prevent you from putting your ponderosa pine on top of a natural gas line or going through your phone line or any number of other electrical. And, and they don't necessarily bury them as deep as they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't go, oh, it should be four feet deep. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> I had an experience back in Minnesota. We lived uh, in uh, a real small rural area and uh, somebody had taken their phone line, buried it in the field where they normally plant and they only went down about six inches. So you can imagine what happened when they were going to plow that. Oh, I, I can visualize <laughs> that one really well. <laughs> really well. Yeah, and I've heard other stories like that too. <laughs> yeah. The phone line is the one that usually gets it or the electrical line or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, doing an inventory helps you know what's going on, especially again, if you move out to the county or or even if you're in the old town area of, of Cheyenne, you know, are those old buildings, are they historical? Should they be treated a little differently? So knowing some of that stuff helps. Again, it's all about doing an inventory, knowing where your well is at, your septic tank, your leach field, you know, planting those outbuildings. And then the plants, old plantings, trees and shrubs. What are their size? Are they mature? Are they babies? What's the health of them? Are they healthy? Are they kind of limping along? You know, what's, can you figure out what's wrong with them? Can you identify them? And will new material fit in? Right. Gardeners, you guys are always trying to shoehorn something else in there, right? Mm -hmm. I am. <laughs> Sometimes I'll dig something up and put something else in there and that something else gets planted in a new place. So, you know, will new material fit in? Your master gardener, you should be all going, oh yeah. <laughs> and, and so I toss that one in. If there isn't any plants on the site, why? Why aren't they there? Believe it or not, I've done yard calls where either the homeowner or the neighbor is afraid of trees. And, and the first time I encountered that, I was just really kind of like, how could you be afraid of a tree? I spent my childhood in, in a tree, climbing trees. <laughs> how could you be afraid of them? But there are quite a few people who are just, one guy, he, he came up to me when I was doing a neighbor's assessment on their tree. And it was just a little crab apple tree, but he was, and it was on the east side of the house, but he was very, very concerned that a branch was going to break off and fly into his house. I mean, he, he was genuinely worried about that. And I've had other people who just are, are very afraid of trees. So why aren't there trees there? I got a neighbor who's the na other neighbor's horses get out and ate all their trees, you know? So there's... Why? <laughs> yeah. And then will they adapt? And this goes back to, you know, now that you know what the USDA zone really is for Cheyenne and some of the requirements that a plant has to take, you know, if the if the little tag says needs moist soil, <laughs> does that describe Wyoming? Well, no, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> not so much. So will they adapt? So if you don't know, do some research on that. Don't trust anything that comes from the big box stores without doing some research on it. And then how will the new plants affect the site? What's that shade or shadow gonna be that they cast? You know, if you're looking for a tree that's gonna shade your house, you're not gonna buy something that's gonna be columnar. There's a lot of new varieties of trees out there that are columnar. There's, there's some oak trees, Corcus fastigata, which are getting planted a lot around here. If you ever go on college in the Greeley Highway, the Maverick over there, there's all those trees in there are columnar oaks. They're doing really well, benign, totally benign neglect. I, I mean, just total, but they're doing really well on that, really, really well. The uh, Woodward Juniper, which are right out front of L Triple C over by the sign, they're only about three feet wide and they go straight up. That is a native plant to Wyoming. 
and it's a columnar juniper. Not gonna get any shade off of that. <laughs> but if you plant something like a prairie expedition elm, you're gonna get shade like that, or maybe even like that. So what do you want that tree to do for you? Do you want shade from it? Do you want it to just be pretty and kind of stately and columnar? So think about how that tree is going to cast, sh cast shade. And what are your soils? You don't need to do a soil test for every area. You can do, you know, we'll, we'll teach you how to do the ribbon test and then the um, water jug test. And, and so you can just look at your soil and go, well, I know what it is. The soil in Wyoming is not as bad as you think. <laughs> I've, I can't tell you how many people have come in and my, I just know my soil is bad. Okay, how do you know it's bad? It just is bad. It's the color of this table, it's bad. So knowing what it is helps, especially, if, especially for those of us who do vegetable gardens. Really don't want to know, really curious, get a soil test. You can either send, we have little jars and you can send the soil down to CSU. And they're a little pricey at like $40, but they're sending you back a wealth of information. You can send it out to Ward Labs out in Kearney, Nebraska. They're a little bit less expensive. They send you a bunch of information that you need to know. But one of the important things with, if you do a soil test, is that lab should be regional. It should be Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, regional. If you send your soil sample back east, they use a whole different set of chemicals to test your soil. And so what you get back is not reliable data. They also don't know Wyoming soils, but if you get do it here, do it locally, they know our soils, they do the right chemistry and give you an accurate picture back of what your soils are. Um, Colorado State University, CSU, CSU will do soil tests. And if you're interested, I'll get um, this little soil packet. You can take it and then you ship it to them. Um, Ward Labs in Kearney, Nebraska. Ward Labs. Ward Labs. And I think there's another Ward Lab down in Greeley, too. Usually in the area where there's a lot of agriculture, they're going to have soil testing labs. Okay. Yep. Don't do it for your lawn. Don't do a soil test for a lawn because you've put or someone has put fertilizers down over time mm -hmm. and it really skews the soil test and it's not ever gonna give you an accurate understanding of what's there. If you want a soil test for your vegetable garden, your flower beds, those sort, you know, you're doing a raised bed, get a soil test for all that stuff, but don't waste your time or money with, with lawns, doing a soil test for lawns. Soil compaction, this is probably one of the biggest problems I've run into, especially for trees. Trees hate so compacted soil. Cottonwood trees, especially if that soil is compacted, their roots come to the surface. And so that's why you get those big, big, you know, big roots on the surface because they can't go, they can't break through the compaction. So they're shallow, they're now they're shallow rooted. So those trees hate compacted soil. They love it down around the creeks because it's deep, loose soil. They can go deep, but yeah, poor cottonwood trees. Okay, water. If you're on city water, you're going to have a pH of 8.5. So the city water is already alkaline. So, so when you go to the the store to buy bottled water and it's like, oh, alkalized water because it's better for you. Just get it out of your tap yeah. instead and save some money. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's just crazy when I see that. The city of water, um, city of Cheyenne water is um, really good water. It is a little on the alkaline side. So just knowing that, add a little bit like a to a gallon of water, add a uh, a teaspoon or two to the water to make it a little bit more acidic. That's all you need. Vinegar. Yep. Vinegar, sorry. Yep. 
And especially for house plants, they'll appreciate that every once in a while. Out in the county, that is kind of a wild card because it varies so much. The water at my place is at a pH of seven. Uh, test it, you want to know what the pH and the EC is. It helps know what the NPK. And uh, if you're testing your water, you're also looking for fecal chloroform. Is there some kind of strips or hmm? uh, how would you test it? Test the water? Yes. So they usually give you like a little jar to test it in, especially the lab, the lab right up there. So you just take your jar and you run water for a few minutes and you put it underneath there and you really put, put the cap on, that's it, and then you send it to the lab. Oh, pretty easy. That way, much easier than doing a soil sample sometimes. Okay. So again, back to kind of the site analysis. Around your site, you're gonna have micro and macro locations and climates. And of course the macro climate is, is the bigger picture. And that's, you know, that may be the area between that garage and the house or uh, between trees out in the open, the microclimates are gonna be what's up close to the house or more protected. And then again, out in the county, if you've got big wind, you're gonna to wanna to put in a windbreak. So where's that windbreak gonna go and how is it going to impact your site? And again, it helps to know how that wind moves through your property so that when you call the conservation district and they come out and they just, you know, put a line on a piece of paper and go, yep, this is where I'm gonna put your trees. And you go, well, no, I've done a site analysis and the wind actually comes from this direction. So you can actually get it in correctly. So rain shadows, kind of have to ignore the fact that it says Puget Sound in the Pacific Ocean on there, <laughs> but it was the best animation I've ever found to describe <laughs> this. So imagine instead of it saying the Pacific Ocean, it says Laramie, and Puget Sound said is Cheyenne, okay? So as that moisture comes up over the mountains, and, and this is again, something that is really observable in the summer. You see all those clouds building up on, on the summit on that pass, but it never makes it down here. So that, that tells you that we're in a rain shadow. And even out where I live, I'm in a little bit of a rain shadow and I can see that it rains my neighbor might get a half inch of rain and I might get a 10th of an inch or I might not get anything. And the neighbors down the road from my night or vice versa, you know, my neighbors might get that half inch and I get a 10th of an inch. So we all have our, a major macro rain, rain shadow and that's those mountains over there. But even in your own site where you live, you're gonna have either rain shadow or not a rain shadow. So Cheyenne's kind of known for its hail. There's a reason for that. You're going, well, yeah, of course there is. Cheyenne is in a bowl. And so when you think about when you leave Cheyenne, if you go east, you've got to go up a hill, right? Mm -hmm. If you go, want to go to Fort Collins, you go up a hill, then you go down a big hill. If you want to go to Laramie, you've got to climb up another hill. If you go towards Wheatland, it's not as obvious, but you're definitely going up a hill and then you go down a big hill. So we're in this big bowl. And over the years, we have planted more trees and we have more lawns and we've actually created more humidity here. So in the summer, when that starts to get warm at the, at the surface area and warm air rises, it gets hit with that cooler air up above us, but it just sits there and it just moves up because we're in a bowl, it just keeps moving like this. And so it just builds and builds and builds. And it's because we're in a bowl. And it's because we've planted more trees, we've added more lawns, we've made the area more humid. And so that's always going to be with us, that big hail. Tell us to just tear out all the plants. <laughs> you know, part of me goes, geez, we went back to the original prairie. We wouldn't have this problem. And the other part of me goes, geez, we need to plant more trees so we can, can really tip the balance and stop this problem. 
So I don't know. That that lesson was from Don Day Jr., who runs Day Weather. Mm -hmm. and, and so he's learned a lot from him. Learned a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, wind breaks. Really, really important. The more rows you can have, the better if you live in town. You can still make a little bit of a, a windbreak. Knowing that there's trees that are columnar or shrubs that are tight and columnar, you can create your own windbreak on your property. But keep in mind, how is that going to impact the snow and drifting? I'm going to drift my garage in. I'm going to drift my house in. But windbreaks can really push that wind up and over. I have a barn that is sloped to the west and the wind hits it and goes straight up over it. And I've got an, like, a, like a zone where the wind doesn't even bother the surface. And I can walk out there, it can be 50 mile an hour winds and I'm not getting blown around at all till I get on either side of that barn. So the barn is, is a windbreak for my house, but you can do it with trees. You can do, this is kind of the standard windbreak format for from the conservation district kind of have that Army Corps of Engineer linear thing. Mm -hmm. You can make your own windbreak. You can design your own windbreak and have them plant it for you. Conservation District's windbreak program is well worth the money. They'll come in and, and plant it for you. Put down the black plastic. You have to put down your own irrigation. But what they can do in about two hours would take you two weeks. <laughs> yeah. The conservation district, they're, they're usually booked up a year in advance for windbreaks. But if you're out in the county and you want them to build one for you, their phone number. It's a really good people to work with. Yeah, Clark. Um, yeah, Clark for sure. I usually I work with a couple of the other guys too. With oh, I work a lot with Sean. Yeah. Worth if you're out in the county and you want a windbreak. Yeah, worth the time and money. Yeah, hands down. Okay, wildlife. So if you're in town. You, I guarantee you, you have a squirrel problem. You probably have a raccoon problem, but really don't know it. I've seen skunks. I've seen all sorts of things. I think the creepiest thing I've seen so far was like at four in the morning with a raccoon crawling out of a grain grate. <laughs> that's, that's just wrong. <laughs> that's just, uh, yeah, that's just wrong. Um, were you just getting in for your party that night? Uh, I was I was leaving to go to DIA for a conference. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to attract wildlife? And what is your definition of wildlife? You know, definitely I, I, not foxes. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't necessarily want the deer in my yard, although they do they do invite, invite themselves, but I want to build gardens for my pollinators. Really important to me to build gardens for for the little native bees and the native butterflies. Mm -hmm. You know, that to me that's real important. That's my version of wildlife. I don't want squirrels. I'm gonna survive out of my place anyway. But squirrels are really destructive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have big dogs. I have big dogs. <laughs> And then, no, I have. That's a good dog. I have. Um, I have Turkish akbash. So I have Turkish akbash to protect my sheep, and they do. And and deer are not welcome. Yeah. And then I have gar I have herding dogs, who are very confused by deer. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. Try to keep the mule deer out. That's hard. Because they're athletic and they're persistent. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, six foot fence is nothing to them. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, this is, these are my sheep, this is my barn. 
And you can see the big drift in front of the barn door. Mm -hmm. So that barn at face is on an east west line facing south. So that big old drift is right there on the south side. So one year I thought, I'm going to move that drift. So I put up a wind fence. So you can manipulate your drifts, but just by plant material or wind fences. Mm -hmm. So I put up a wind fence and I did. I moved the drift. I moved the drift in front of my gate. And so now I can't open the gate when I get back drifts. <laughs> <laughs> but the sheep can get in the barn. So I don't know. Okay. Yeah. One to seven. Question. Sure. Boxes are the answer. <laughs> I, I, and I'm and I'm serious when I say boxes are the answer. You know, we we have not had a problem with rabbits eating our stuff since we put down. We started over seeding every area of our lawn with clover. So the rabbits are there all the time. But they eat the clover. They don't get into any of the beds. They don't eat any of the beds. It's for us. Okay, clover. They love the clover. They love, yeah. And anything that grows in the lawn that's a grass, I don't worry about because I just do not have grass. Sometimes the cats will take care of rabbits too. Yeah, yeah, cats will hunt rabbits. <laughs> Sometimes um, I have three herding dogs and they've given up chasing the rabbits. <laughs> They'll kind of give, you know, an honorable 20 feet. And, and then you can see, I kind of see them going, I turn around and walk away. <laughs> yeah. And the rabbit goes another 40 feet and stops. And it's like, really? <laughs> biggest menace we have in the county is grass. So ground squirrels, so your ground squirrels and your prairie dogs like really short grass. They like that short grass so that they can see the predator coming. They can see the hawk, the owl, they can see the fox or the coyote coming. And so short grass is, is their paradise. If you let that grass get tall and they can't see over that grass, they leave, but they love short grass. That is their paradise. That's perfect for them. They love the are you are you in town or on the farm? I'm in town. Okay. That's, that's how we beat the, the ground squirrel. I, I can I can I can guarantee you that the short grass was why they were there. If you were mowing your prairie, yeah, it was in the front yard. So yes, we were mowing the prairie. Who cares? Don't don't mow. You know, I live out in the county. I don't mow. I, I might mow a path to my upper gardens, but you know, I need that. I need that grass to shade the soil mm -hmm. and to hold the soil, and I need that grass tall so it holds the snow and doesn't drift. So the tall grass is a benefit, and it's not. Everybody moves out of the prairie and goes, "Ooh, grass is a fire hazard," and they mow it. Well, they've just created a fire hazard because now they've exposed the soil surface to more sun. And so that soil surface dries out, your cool season grass dies and you end up with warm season grass, which is your buffalo and blue grandma. And that stuff is a fire hazard. So yeah, yeah, I, I've been fighting that one for 21 years. Don't mow, don't mow and you, you won't. And I, I talked with another lady who's just up, on the um, like tranquility and that area. And it was like, how do I get rid of the, the prairie dogs? And I pull her up on Google Earth because I was busy and I didn't want to drive out there. But maybe I was being lazy that day. <laughs> but I pulled it up on Google Earth because I can give her an instant answer by looking. And it's like, is everybody mowing? I said, and she goes, yeah. Is this why you have prairie dogs? because you're all mowing. If you stop today and don't mow again, you'll slowly get rid of your prairie dogs and they'll all go to your neighbors. Yep. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. She ran into me like a month ago and we talked about it and she says, yeah, they all moved out. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so easy. People spend lots of money buying poisons to get rid of them when all they would need to do is let the grass grow. Mm -hmm. There's always an easy answer. I mean, there really is always a super a simple solution a lot of times. Anyway, that's my two cents worth. <laughs> Okay, so this is just some scrap paper to work with because this is going to get messy. I'm not trying to wax that on. Square pencils. I have lots of spare everything. Yeah, if you if you want to take a little break, we can take a break. Get something to drink. I have healthy snacks. Grab a snack. <laughs> Thank you. 
So that's my house. Is, mm -hmm. is that what you were talking about? No. It's obviously right. a plot. Right, but that's works. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't really mean it was distance from the other. Mm -hmm. So my room is dated by a world. Yeah, so all the winds fly. Mm -hmm. If you were talking about your bar, mm -hmm. you can walk in anywhere in the pier. Lots of the green house is flat now. Now all of this is raised. And Susan's fever Tomatoes from Johnny C. That's right. I teach other than Johnny C. So we know the It'll be reported. Yep, thank you. Yep. Looking forward to that. Well, I have to. Yeah, I, Johnny says a good resource. That's why I got on the third page. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
Yeah, so when you bring it up, <laughs> click on the little camera where it says measure distance, mm -hmm. and then you can click one point. Yeah. This is the afternoon side, this is the morning side. You see this? Okay. So as the sun comes up on the morning of June 21st, first day of summer, the sun is going to be all along this side. It'll be back here too. Right? It's going to be sunny all through here. This is going to be sunny. This is all going to be sun. This is going to be sun. Over the sun here, over there. It makes sense. Sun just rose. First day of summer. So, again, watch how the sun moves through your property. And then where it's at on March. In March and September, it's going to be straight in like that. There are going to be things getting in the way because, you know, trees and buildings and stuff, but that's how the sun's going to come in. That morning, this is all going to be in shade. I'll show you this side's all in shade. 
Okay. So now it's the afternoon of June 21st. The sun comes in. It's still sunny back here, right? A little bit of sun over here. And this side is now all in the sun. This is all sun. Sunny. This is all sun. So when I said I've got a shade garden on the south side of an east-west hedge line, so like this, that's all in shade, right? If I put it on the north side, it would be a sun garden. I do have I do have that. I have this, this very sunny, sun loving garden on the north side of my cabin. And I have a shade loving garden on the south side of my east west hedge line. Okay. Kind of making sense. It's like I'm not wrapping my head around this. <laughs> so now, if you wanted to build a deck, you decided you want to build a deck. Where would you put a deck that would be afternoon shade, morning sun? In Colorado? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you the tools so that no matter where you move to, whether you move to Seattle, Washington, or you move, move down to Myrtle Beach, you still have these tools and knowing that at different latitudes, that sun angle is going to change. You know, if you were to go up to, let's say, Missoula, Montana, the sun angle would be more like this. If you went down to Myrtle Beach, the sun angle would be really flat like that. So it changes depending upon where you're physically located. This reflects the 41st parallel which is the Colorado Wyoming border, right on that point of parallel. You okay. said afternoon shade and morning sun. Where would you put it at? Oh, on the east. So then I'm going to throw in so the winds, right? Winds, because that's important part of site analysis. Yeah. And you're looking at the whole area or just? I, I look at the whole picture. Okay. The whole picture. So this is. Your winter winds, right? The winter winds. Your summer winds, which are not as bad. You know, these summer winds are kind of blowing off the planet or freezing to death. So, your summer winds are down here. So, the best place for a deck is. You know, the shade is coming in the house, we put a shade. The house comes in and shades. And so this is all shady in the afternoon. So the afternoon shade, right in that corner. It's also protected from the wind. So where would you put a deck? In that corner. Okay. Now what I want you to do, because this is a workshop type night, you're going to take this sundial, you're going to take the sundial, and you're going to put it behind the house. And you're going to kind of put the middle of that sundial right in the center of the house. And that really gives you an idea of the seasonal sun changes. It's not quite perfect. The offset. Put the sun dial behind the house. Put the center of the sun dial in the middle of the house. Now, what I want you to do is take your pencil, colored pen, pen, whatever of your choice. And I want you to draw in the north, south, east, west lines on it. 
And I want you to put in the sun is rising on June 23rd and the sun on June 23rd. And I want you to put that on the house. Could we extend the line out or just stay in the house? Right, send the line way out. And so you can just, just trace it right off of that. So again, sundial on the house, middle of the sundial to be in the center of the house. June 21st. Mm -hmm. June 21st. With this sundial, you can figure out every day where the sun should be or might be, could be, and how it's going to impact your house and shadows, day. Okay. So now I want you to. On your house, I want you to put in the sun just rose on June 21st. Sun just rose. I want you to put in where the sun is hitting, what surfaces are the sun hitting? You know, what side of the garage, what side of the house? Well, where is that sun touching on the house and the garage? AM. Yep, the sun just rose. Okay. So if you can see my scribbling over there. So what surfaces is the sun touching on the house and the garage? Sun just rose. Just, just look at your paper and, yep. Okay, so now sun's moved across the sky. It's, it's at the highest arc, right? Because it's the sun is as far north as it's going to go into the earth tips, which is why it's so far north. We all know that. So now I want you to put in the afternoon. The sun is getting ready to set. Where is the sun hitting the house and the garage? And on that on that day, at that time, where is your shadows? Where is the shape? So you're gonna just bring it out. Sun setting. So this is all gonna be day. This is all day here. This is all day here. Afternoon shade. Afternoon shade. Where's the afternoon shade? Sun is setting, June 21st. Where's your afternoon shade? We, we kind of know how the sun is hitting the buildings, but what kind of shadow is it casting? What kind of shadow is that building casting? So now I'm going to put a couple of trees in here because I want shade. Where would you put those trees on your property to get summer afternoon shade? It's June 21st. 
Where are you going to put those trees to shade the house? You want the trees between the sun and the house. Trees go between the sun and the house. Where are you going to put those trees? You want the trees to shade the house. You want the trees to shade the house. Where would you put the trees so that they're between the sun and the house? You want afternoon shade. So confused. Those are your trees in the front of the house. So this is the front of the house down here. Well, the north part of the house. And I want those trees between the sun and the house. Okay, I want the trees to shade the house. Oh, my. trees to shade the trees to shade the house. Where are you going to put the trees? That is not what I understood. Trees are shading the house. I don't need to call three number three, but I'm shaking it even. If you could put another tree here, that part, and then it would come down like that. Yes. Okay. Uh, so that about where everybody parked their trees. Makes sense. Does it make sense to you guys? Yeah, yes. Yes. Between, between sun mm -hmm. and the house. Or afternoon shade. Now, now, what if, what if, you know, everybody knows you put a tree on the south side of the house to shade it, right? If you live in Myrtle Beach. Yeah. But if I put a tree right here, <laughs> mm -hmm. then what am I shading? The front street. I'm shading the street, which is actually not a bad thing because you know the asphalt can be yeah. So shading the street's not a bad thing, but it's not going to benefit the house. Right. Your neighbor is going to park under your tree. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's the shade. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. There we go. It's now December. Mm. Yeah. It's December 21st. The sun just grows. So, sunrise on December 21st. Where is the sun hitting the house? <laughs> and, by the way, I'm sorry, I've got um, colored pencils if anybody needs them. That would help. Sometimes having colors makes a difference if anybody needs them. Yeah, so this gets a little messy, right? Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Okay, so December 21st is the morning side because 
Please. Yeah, the new side. Sun just rose. Where's the sun going to hit these buildings? It's all going to be now. It's now it's just bubbling. Sun will be on this side. Sun will be here. <clears throat> it's all shadow. It's a little bit of sun up here, not much. What did you just say? It's all shadow. Um, this is all going to be in shadow. Yeah. No sun. No sun. Which one want that? Yeah. <laughs> you want to find one more? Yeah. Exactly. So, what we planted a tree here. Where's the sun is hitting this? Where's the decay going to be from this tree? If it's a pine tree, you know, then, then this is all going to be baby. Well, my neighbor had trees all along here. Yeah. Shady in the winter. Very shady. Mm -hmm. Hey, so the sun just set December 21st. Where's the sun? Where's the sun strike the buildings? And now, what's in shade? So now that you've done summer and winter, again, where would you put your deck? Where would you put that deck to get the best sun, get some shade, be protected from the winds? Would you change the location of your deck? So yeah, you have two decks. <laughs> so you're, you're an early riser and you want to go out and sit on your deck with that morning cup of coffee. Coffee. Where would you put that deck? <laughs> it's going to be the most private location. Get out of the wind. You don't get a lot of morning sun in the winter. Get the summer sun. The shade in the summer. It's always going to be shady in the winter. This making sense, sort of kind of. It's messy. It's really messy. Mm -hmm. Okay, we like messy. Yeah. Okay. Next house. Mm -hmm. Same thing. So I want you to grab a hold of the one that's not messy. Where's that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the First Avenue house, which is on a huge block. Hill Center, your sundial in the center of the house, yep. center of the property. Do it, in the, do it in the center of the house. So you want to center in the middle of the house. Is this part of the house? Okay. Is that the whole house? That's the house. What is it? What's on the side? That's on the side. Okay, this is the whole house. You can put the house on the ground. Okay. That's the house. Okay. 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 Oh, 
So again, on this one, on the First Avenue house, you know, trace in the lines for when the sun comes in, the seasonal sun lines. Because that, that'll just help you out so much as far as how the sun hits the house and moves through the property. Okay, so again, June 21st, the morning of June 21st, the sun just rose, first day of summer, summer morning, beautiful summer morning. Where is the sun hitting the house? What are all the locations that that sun's going to hit the house? It's going to be the east side. What about the back side of the house? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So that north side of that house is going to be in full sun from sunrise to sunset. So the north side of the house is in sun. Yes? For tonight's exercise for your homework period, that we that that we're not going to be just people who are choosing them without the Okay, so now it's June 21st, it's the afternoon. How is that sun, how is that sun moved through the property? And again, where is the, where is the sun hitting the, the house on that, on that afternoon? And then where's your shade? Where's the shade at? Where do we put the shade? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, pencil the shade in. Okay. Especially for those of you who brought the entire color spectrum of crayons, <laughs> go for it. So if you wanted to put a deck in and you're, you know, it's a lovely summer day and of course you're outside and it's just wonderful and you're going, gosh, I'd love to have a deck, you know, just a nice deck or a patio. Where would you put that, that deck or patio on the, on along this house? And then, and then all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and you go, oh, winter winds. Yeah. Oh, winter winds. Mm -hmm. So how would you protect that deck? Or that patio from the winter winds. So draw in a deck and then draw in a windbreak. Right. We're talking it's summer and you're and you're just going, wow, I just want to be out here. I want to be out here with my morning cup of coffee and I want to barbecue out here and so I want a deck or a patio and of course your mind's like I don't know how to build one I can do this it's easy you know I got a shovel it's my attitude I got a shovel I'm dangerous and a big a big hole yeah it's a good question so in the summer do you want to be in the shade in the morning or do you want to be in the sun in the morning Good question. So you want to be able to sit out on this deck, a little privacy. You want that summer, you want that morning sun, because you're gardeners, right? Morning is your favorite time of the day. 
You're all early risers, right? You get up with the sun and you're out there gardening. I have a few people going. <laughs> so you want to have that privacy. So where where on that site would it be private? Would you put a deck or a patio? And then how would you protect it from the wind? What kind of wind break would you put in? Or even if you're going, well, oh, a tree, a tree would be nice, a shade tree. Where would you put that shade tree and, and a little windbreak? There really isn't any wrong, right or wrong answers on this, but it's just to get you to think, think about how you would site and how would you plan these things. Where would you put a patio on the east side? Hmm? Put a patio on the east side. Morning, yeah, my cup of coffee out. You, know, you want some privacy or random. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be sitting out there and having your neighbor going, Hi, out their bathroom window. Right. 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 So then, so, so go back to that sundial, that sun angle. And, and use that to figure out how you would get that afternoon shade on your trees. And the, shade, the trees are going to shade your. Yeah. So I like that idea of putting the deck on the east side because this is, you know, if you notice on here, this is 30 feet here. Good chance there's going to be a fence here. And a good chance that your neighbor is also going to be 30 foot set back. So you could actually do a wrap around deck, come, yep. oh, come around like this. Oh, that's an excellent idea. You can come over here and put your pine trees in. Because this site, again, is big enough. When they grow in 20 years, they'll fall in your house. They'll well, avoid the house. <laughs> you know how to take care of your pine trees so that they don't do that. Right. Right. That's, that's one of the things idea. we'll learn in class is how to take care of your pine trees. Okay. So you got pine trees. It's a okay. pair of greens or the break. Okay. You're going to I'd like some shade. So again, remember we've got this. We got the sun angles coming through here. So remember, we got the sun angles. And remember, we're on the 41st parallel, so that, that does have an impact as to where the sun angles are at. Morning sun is coming in, it's June 21st. Sun's coming in. It's going to be sunny here. It's going to be sunny all along through here. This is going to be all in the full sun. Afternoon, full sun. All sun. Oh, this is now in the shade. So now you have a shady spot for the afternoon. Sure. When, when. I want, want more shade. I want more shade because I want my deck in the shade. I want a shady deck. Where would you put that tree? So you know how the sun angles move through there. Where would you put a tree to shade that? Mm -hmm. 
comes right here. So that that comes through you know, like this. So now you got the shade off the tree. Mm -hmm. That's the afternoon. That's in the afternoon. Yep. Yep. Hey. So now it's. <clears throat> but if you look at it too, you know, here's March and September. And that sun is coming in straight in. So there again, this is going to be in the sun. This is going to be, you know, a little bit, not much, a little bit, but this is all full sun now. This is this is all in the shade. So you just went to the nursery, or you're at the big box store and you're selling a whole bunch of stuff which trying to get rid of it. And you buy some plants that say full sun. <laughs> full sun plants. Where are you going to, where on your site, where on this house, are you going to put plants that love full sun? Anywhere in the backyard. Anywhere in the backyard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the backyard is amazing. <laughs> on the fence line. Yeah, this, this is a real site. And it's half an acre. Mm, yeah, it's a real science happening. So where where along the house, I realize the backyard is ginormous, but where along the house would you put plants that have a requirement of life's full sun? Should it be on the on the other side of the on the drive in the north? Yeah, yeah you can put them all up yeah, right here. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Yep. But if you put if you put plants here, where you put your, yeah, your driveway is going to get snowed in. Yeah, the technology is in my way. Uh -huh. So this is I just put some shrubs on the west side. Of a north south line, what's going to happen? I'm, I'm, I'm risking drifts. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking big the drifts, other side. but they're going to be drifts. And now, if you look at how this house is set up, remember snow likes to accumulate the most on the south side of the east west line. Where's the snow going to go on this house? <laughs> right here, yeah. Right into the driveway. Yep, yep, yep. Probably going to pack up a little bit in here, too. Make sure your shovel is on the back side of the house. <laughs> you can put it on the shovel up in front of the house. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we put a windbreak in, we put a shade tree in, we put the deck in. We, we kind of acknowledge the winds just by the windbreak, right? The winds predominantly going to come out of the, theoretically out of the west to the northwest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, feeling kind of comfortable with this? Kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. kind of like sort of kind of making sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A blank piece of paper. So we, we talk about the, the topography lines, the topo lines, mm -hmm. and, and how they're, when they're closer together, it's steeper. So the closer we're together they are, the steeper that is. The farther apart they are, the more gentle sloping they are. Okay. So we kind of have an idea of how the water is going to flow on this property, how it's going to move. Right. We also kind of have an idea about where the snow is going to stick and where it's going to drift. 
So what I want you to do now is, is on this map, I want you to put in just sort of the winds. So if we go back to, the winds. I want you to put the winds in on this site. So again, take your, take your sundial, because you can still use the compass on here, the north, south, east, west. Okay. And so put that behind here and figure out how you think the winds are gonna move through this. This is out, this is a big site. This is a couple of acres. And so how, how is the wind on the prairie gonna move through this site? How do you think it's gonna move through the site? Are we still looking at June? Or does the date matter? Date doesn't matter. So we're gonna do it seasonally. So you're gonna put in your winter winds, your summer winds, because summer winds are different than the winter winds. It shifts and changes. So while you're putting the winds in, I also want you to put in there how you think the big rainstorm came through. How do you think the water is going to move through that site? And Yeah, so we know the high points up here, and we got a low point down here. That's it. How do we know that? I, I'm not telling you that. How do we know that? Let's see. This is 699. Oh, no. And then this is the highest point. So again, how do you think that water is going to flow through that property? And, and you should have drawn in the winds too, as to where the winds are going to be coming from and how the winds are going to move through the property. So if you just kind of work off of the, the assumption of the prevailing winds, and north is up, south, east, west. You know the winds are going to kind of move through from here to there, the winter winds. And so the winter winds are always your worst case. Those are the ones that you really kind of want to figure out a way to defend yourself from. 
So you know how the water, wind moves through here, the water moves through here. Because you're watching the sun, you know how the sun's going to move through there, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, can you, can you guys see this back there? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Morning. So now, so you've kind of done a preliminary site analysis on this property, got a feel for the winds. You, where do you think the snow is going to drift on this? Put in the snow drift. Where you, what do you think? And remember, snow likes to drift on the south side of an east-west line. That's that's where most snow is going to accumulate on that south side. So we know this is a ridge. We know this is a fairly tight topography line. So that's steep right there. So the snow is actually going to be pretty big to accumulate like this. This is going to be pretty wind swept through here. Okay. Where would you put a windbreak? This is a big site. You might actually have to put a couple windbreaks in here. So we know we're going to work on where the snow goes and then a windbreak. And you can use a windbreak to help mitigate that snow drift. You can manipulate that drift by structures, trees, shrubs. I put a wind fest fence up on my property and I moved a snow drift. I moved it from the front of my barn to the front of my gate. <laughs> <laughs> so this is to prevent the snow from going to the road? I don't care about the road. Well, what is the yeah. drift for? What is the drift? Why is the place where it's placed? Other than stopping it, stopping from the wind. Hitting your home. We know that drift is going to want to form off that ridge. Yeah. yeah. So if we go back to, so this is a snow drift. This is actually my property in the snow. That's my husband's truck that's buried. So it doesn't park there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so. So if you see on here, this is a this is west and east. So this is a an east-west ridge, and the snow is all formed on the south side of this. Kind of do the same thing here. It's going to drift right there in that ridge. They put a snow fence up. Well, they, they put a fence up, and it's full of tumbleweeds. And so it snagged all the snow and drifted the road. Yeah. Very effective. So you know this. Where would you put a windbreak in and kind of mitigate this? Yeah. We try to start up here. You know this is going to be difficult, but you, you kind of want to arc it down like that. And you want to try to hold the snow. I actually started up here and I try to hold as much snow up here as I can to reduce that. And I might even put more tree here to again try to pull the snow and keep it up tighter. As you can see, how tight I mean, that snow drift is right up against those eastern red cedars. And so those trees. Are holding the snow and keeping it there. So that can, picture you're looking south, right? Um, this is west. I'm actually looking west on that. So it's the south side of those trees. South side of those trees. Yep. South side of those trees. Always. So 
Well, the homestead is actually up in the corner. We haven't put the house on yet. Okay. That's next. I can put the house. I'm not. I'm <laughs> buying a place in the, in the city. <laughs> I'll graze my cattle there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, is that what we're working on? Mm -hmm. Okay, so is this is this making sense? Sort of kind of. Yeah, I'm trying to picture so, this in my head. Trying to do with having multiple rows of, of trees or windbreaks. Right. You're trying to manipulate that snow, and you're trying to hold it either farther up because now your next thing that you're going to do is you're going to put a driveway in that goes to the house. Where are you going to put the house, and where are you going to put the driveway? Okay, so the comment is I'm going to put the house on the high spot. Here's the problem of putting the house on the high spot that's a gravel road, and you will be eating gravel dust all year round. Yeah. That is a hateful place to put it. Plus, when you put your house so close to the road, you now have a security issue because you're the first and easiest target. So from security, it's really a bad idea. Just mm -hmm. driving my property cover. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd want to put it smack dab in the middle. I think I'd bring it a little bit farther down. So we know the water. So when that snow melts or the rain hits, we know how that water is going to flow through the property, right? Right. We know how the wind moves through the property. We know how the sun moves through that property. We've already designed in a windbreak to try to mitigate the snow drifts because we figured out the snow drift problem. So now, where would you put your driveway to access your house, and where would you put your house? The main road is to the north. This is the road up here. That's the road up oh, there. Oh yeah. The shield lane. Okay. This is this is a real site. Okay. Okay. This is actually a real site, and the topography I've drawn in, I've taken artistic liberty, but I'm not too far off. Okay. Oh, it really is. This is the road. And you got a file. Where would you put your house? Uh, where would you put your house? Uh, now there's a utility. Yeah, yep, and then run into that. And so PJ brought up a good point. You know, you're looking at this survey, and there's an easement on there, right? Yeah, it's a high power line easement. Yeah, so you have to. You can't. You cannot put your house underneath it and kind of like scam well, off the electrical going over the top. <laughs> <and go>, oh, <laughs> <it's free." laughs> Jail time. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> boy, yeah. <laughs> so, so that kind of eliminates a little bit of that property because yeah. you've got this. Yeah. You've got this easement wow. thing going through here. Uh -huh. What about in the area that's kind of flat between, you know, two lines that are further wider and more? We've got a utility. It's not too close. Well, you cut the house in. Remember, this is this is a pencil on a piece of paper, and you can erase that house. Put it someplace else. That's right. That's the beauty of this is that it's not permanent. It's, yeah, right. It's movable. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you have the window. We have to decide how big it is and what direction it's facing. Yep. Doesn't have to be a big house, doesn't have to be a small house. It can be just a little little square rectangle, wherever you want, a little round something, wherever. It's just where would you place that house? Don't don't Stay overthink there. the size. Just 
Just find the location there about where I'm going. And you can do an earth firm house if you want. You can do an earth firm house. Okay, so now you've cited your house, right? Everybody's everybody's put a house in. Okay. <laughs> Where would you put your vegetable garden? And where would you put your shade trees? Again, remember you, you're going after that summer afternoon shade. Right. Summer afternoon shade. Where are you gonna put your house? Where are you gonna put your shade trees? And where are you gonna put your vegetable garden? Find your vegetable garden have shade. Some of my best vegetable gardens have been grown in the shade. But you want the house in the shade, and then where would you put your vegetable garden? And vegetable gardens do best with morning sun mm -hmm. and afternoon shade. The whole myth about, you know, 12 hours of sun every day, no. Morning sun is best, and then some afternoon shade really helps out a vegetable garden. And taking into consideration the water. We're, yeah, we're making some assumptions here. Okay. Yeah, don't overthink it. Okay. Don't overthink it. So, trust me, I, I put a garden up in a place, and I looked at my husband and said, so now we need to dra dig a trench. <laughs> and run water up there, and so we did. <laughs> oh, <killed. laughs> okay, this is where I would put the garden. And remember, you want your garden convenient to the house. Right. This is a big property, and you don't want to put your your garden an acre away. Right. You want your you want your garden as close to the house as possible. So this is a vegetable garden, right? You're growing vegetables right. to put up, can, preserve, mm -hmm. so that you have something in the winter. So you want that vegetable garden close so it's convenient. Trust me, if it's on the downside, it's at the bottom of the hill, it's, it's by August, it's out of sight, it's out of mind, it doesn't exist. And it's that weedy mess down there. Yep. <laughs> so you want that vegetable garden in your face. Yeah. Yep. I still haven't put in the driveway. Can I use an uh, helicopter? <laughs> just parachute in? Yeah, just parachute in. <laughs> oh. Oh. It could be a very long drive. It, it could be, but there's nothing wrong with that. No. And and again, you can manipulate how the wind drifts the snow. You can control that. So if you've got a long driveway, your driveway is coming in, and it's, and you parked your house here. Mm -hmm. And you've got this driveway. Well, you just plant your you just plant trees and shrubs along through there, which makes so sense. So now you're holding the snow there, yep. <clears throat> and so right. this stays clear. Right. So if you put in more open shrubs, or well, how whether they're open or tightly dense, kind of determines how the snow gets spread. Mm -hmm. If they're more open and airy type shrubs, then the snow is going to spurt mm -hmm. or a bigger area. If they're tight and dense, it's going to hold the snow right there. But you want to spread that snow out or a bigger area. You want your garden like right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the east side, east yep. side, running sun yep. for a vegetable garden is always the best. Mm -hmm. So, so a better yield on the north yeah. side, and then put shade trees and warm. So that's a good side of what temperature does. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at this. Okay, yeah. so where would you put? So now, now your your other half comes along and says, "You want to put up a barn? Want to put up a workshop?" <laughs> Where would you put that workshop? And you're thinking, you know, I can use this to act as a windbreak at the house. Yeah. Where would you put it and how would you line it up? Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you that, uh, some help on this. Uh, so if you're on a workshop, workshop. Um, actually, so if this is your house, you want to put that barn yeah. in like this. So if this is the roof line, right? Mm -hmm. This is now protecting your house and the wind is going to go up and over. So here's the, the garage and here's your house. This is the house. Wind just goes up and over. Workshop. Yep, workshop. Mm. I know. Look at swirl. Don't swirl there on the north side of the house. Yeah, the wind will the wind will kind of get a little weird over here. But you can again, you can control that and you can manipulate how that wind goes through there. And you're going, yeah, oh, Venturi effect, right? Remember yeah. Venturi effect? This is a Venturi right here where the wind gets funneled down and it pops out here, but it goes through here. If it starts out 10, it's coming out 30. Mm -hmm. Because of the Venturi, it squeezes it and forces it to go faster. You know, yeah, I'm getting knocked out my feet. I don't like that. So the answer is to plant. Plant more trees. Yeah, yep. Plant some pine trees back here. Yeah, the wind break. You want to burn up away so you don't drift everything in. So remember, this is now the south side of an east-west line. So you put your, your trees there. You stop the wind. Yeah, that's got a little bit more moisture back there, but that's okay. Your master gardeners, you'll figure out what to do with shady, moist area, right? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Vegetation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Questions, thoughts? Looks like a mess. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, yeah, everything's going like, everything in their big traps. I put them like two foot long traps that are maybe we don't hold them just to kind of hold and squirt the snow and not let it. Yeah, I think I put them like on the other side. Kind of prevent it. Yeah. Uh, but they're going to be back. They're going to be back about 20 feet. I mean, uh, so they're not right up along that driveway. Right. Okay. Unless, of course, you want to put trees on each side and make it look really lovely as you're coming down the driveway. Oh, the grand, the grand allee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I, that there, looks great down south. Doesn't work so well up north. It's hard up here. I, and I have done some yard calls. The people have tried to do that with the wrong trees, and mm -hmm. that's a loser. So this is this is the extent of this lecture tonight. I I have included the homework assignments with your packets. <laughs> yeah.
Now this is for our home, right? For your property. Okay. So the hot and cold spots are gonna be, when you look at that property, in the sun, and it's gonna be in the summer too, think about it. Yeah. The sun's coming in, this side in the summer is gonna be the hot side. This is gonna be cooler. Yeah, I already know where the north and west and east and south are. Don't take the wind and the ranks and run the Well, the, sun, the wind comes in from a different, a different angle altogether. And in the summer, the, the wind, it's not a dry out, the wind is just deep on the trees. But it's not hard on the house. Right. Where in the winter, when you get winter winds, and your house is getting beat up by those women. That's that's harder to keep the house. Just just the sun. Don't overthink it. Follow the sun. Follow the sun. Yeah. My husband's an electrical engineer. He overthinks everything. Oh, yes. I've heard about those electrical companies. They always do the better mouse crap, don't they? I'm not It's kind of like the electrician that doesn't do anything on his own house because he's been spending all day fixing other people's homes. It took me two years to to rewire my land bar and it set up lights. It took me another two years after that to put up a light on the outside of my room so I wasn't watching them with her. And then the light was There you go. Oh, that's Yeah. Show over here. Yeah, look at things you can tell your grandkids. Yeah, I'm going to spend more time with things away. First class, I'm going to. Good night, everybody.